with prayer. Heavenly Father, tonight as we begin, we lift up our world to you and we pray uh, that for the sake of the world, you would send your disciples uh, to every place in the world so that they can share uh, the good news that Christ has died and risen to set us free from sin and from death and that we can, by the power of God's Word and the Holy Spirit who works in that Word, trust in Him. We can entrust our sins and know that they are covered. We can entrust our lives and know that we are yours forever. For this gospel, we give you thanks and we pray, Lord, that the whole world would know Jesus and uh, not as a kind of cartoon figure, not as a caricature, but as he really is, a true God and true man who has uh, borne our sins on the cross and opened up eternity through his resurrection for us. We thank you for his sinless life, for his death and his resurrection. And we pray that your Holy Spirit, who proclaims the gospel, the good news about Jesus, will uh, be with us tonight as we dig into your word. And we pray, Lord, that there might be people who look in, who um, don't know you or who aren't sure about you, who will uh, come to believe. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're on to, in chapter 2, on to verse 6. And uh, in order to set the stage a little bit, what I'd like to do is uh, turn your attention to some words of Jesus back in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 5, and then we'll skip down to verses um, uh, 23 and 24. So Matthew 24, verse 5, and Jesus here is uh, talking about the end of life in this fallen world, the day of the Lord when he will return. So take a look at 24, Matthew 24, verse 5. Jesus says, For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. And then if you slip down to verses 23 and 24, you'll read where Jesus says, Then if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the elect. So, these words of Jesus are important as background in understanding what Paul has to say in our uh, chapter tonight, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. That doesn't mean that it's easy. Um, take a look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. I happen to have it uh, bookmarked on my computer right now. 2 Peter chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Peter writes this, Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters speaking in them of these matters. His letters contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, there are several things that are interesting about that little bit from Second Peter. The first thing is that clearly, uh, by the time Peter wrote his second letter to the churches in Asia Minor, the letters of Paul, including 
uh, 2 Thessalonians, which we've already said was probably written in uh, AD 50, <coughs> excuse me, AD 51 or 52, were already regarded as Scripture, already seen as having uh, a place in the canon alongside the Old Testament Scripture. So that means that Peter wrote his letter somewhat uh, later than 2 Thessalonians. <coughs> Excuse me. All of a sudden, I have a tickle in my throat like I did that one night week before last. The second thing it tells us that is that Paul's letters circulated well beyond the areas uh, to which uh, they were originally addressed. And this is why we have them today. The church collectively, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, saw these as um, being worthy of included in a New Testament canon, reflecting the teaching of, of the apostles, which you know, we consider the apostles teaching the ones who were with Jesus as being authoritative uh, because they reflect Jesus' teaching. You remember Jesus' promise? In fact, this was in the gospel lesson this past Sunday, I believe, from the gospel of John. Jesus promised the apostles, um, and Paul was a late apostle, that the Holy Spirit uh, would cause them to recall the things that Jesus taught them, uh, as well as talking about the events of Jesus' ministry. So, number one, we, uh, we see um, Paul's letters were regarded as authoritative very early. Secondly, they had wide circulation. But we also see what we're going to see tonight in chapter 2, which we've already seen somewhat in chapter 2, which is that some of this stuff that Paul is talking about is hard to understand. And uh, no one, no scholar today claims to fully understand it. This lack of understanding applies particularly to two topics that Paul addresses in chapter 2. First of all, the man of lawlessness. We don't know who that is. Um, and um, what the what Luther and the other reformers suggested, the Lutheran reformers suggested, was that the man of lawlessness. Um, though a human being, was not Satan himself, and that's clear from what Paul says, but that the man of lawlessness um, would, uh, that there would be manifestations of this condemned person. Uh, the term that, that Paul uses is son of perdition, that is, um, the son of one who is condemned. Uh, and, you know, kind of the very manifestation of, of what is condemned, which is to replace ourselves or something else for God. In other words, um, claiming that a human being with evil intentions has or is of God or is God himself or is the Christ, the Messiah. Now, in Luther's time, he claimed uh, that the Pope was the Antichrist, not uh, as an individual, but that the
and um, thereby people astray. And we've seen Jesus' words about that. We've seen Paul's words about that. Now, we can see the spirit of the Antichrist anytime someone um, misuses their authority, whether uh, spiritual or civil, to claim godhood for themselves. Um, so that's the first thing that we see is, you know, we just don't know who this person is going to be. And then uh, the second one will come up in the, uh, in the verses that we're going to attack this evening. So, um, there is some lack of clarity but what is very clear is the importance of vigilance of, as Jesus would say, not falling asleep. Uh, not, and, and Paul talks about that in Romans. We had adult Sunday school class this past week and we were in Romans 14. Paul talks about being wakeful and sober. First Thessalonians talks about that as well. All right, so let's pick up now at verse 6 with that background behind us. Verse 6. And you know what is restraining him now, so that he may be revealed in his time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now do so until he is out of the way. Now, Two things here. First of all, we, we find the second thing we don't know the answer to, which is, what is it that is restraining the man of lawlessness now? There are theories about this. One popular theory among Lutherans and others is that uh, the force restraining the lawless one is the state, that is, government restraining those who would set themselves up as alternative gods. Now, keep in mind, Paul is talking at that point about the Roman government, which was not exactly a hospitable place for Christians. Paul has already experienced how inhospitable it is when he was in Thessalonica. He was only able to be there for three weeks because the people were able to prevail upon the government. So, you know, everything was working against him there. So he understands how there can be breakdowns of civil authority that make it uh, difficult to proclaim the gospel. Nonetheless, Paul sees the importance of government. Now, this goes back to our old topic a very important one, I think, uh, of the two kingdoms. This is not referencing the kingdom of God and the kingdom of the devil. This is, this is uh, referencing two ways in which God rules over the world today. One is through the kingdom of God that is composed of people who have been baptized and trust in Jesus Christ. Um, the other way, and, and that's, a, that's, that's a, not a kingdom ruled by coercion, that's a kingdom ruled by grace, in which people, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, through daily repentance and renewal, daily acquiesce to the lordship of Jesus Christ, and therefore are uh, awake and enlivened to the call to love God and love neighbor, not out of a sense of obligation, not because there's some compunction involved, but out of simple gratitude for grace. Uh, so in that kingdom of God, there is, uh, uh, you know, and when people are ruled by God, they're still sinners, of course, 
but as they turn back to God daily, uh, they're again, again, alive and sensitive uh, to the call to cherish life, uh, to love others, to view others as better than than themselves, not out of self-loathing, but out of a recognition that we belong to God and that all people are important and that we don't need to push ourselves forward because in Christ we've already been justified, we've already been vindicated, we've already been approved, we've already been accepted, we already uh, have the Holy Spirit living within us. Um, we are given the confidence of knowing that we belong to our Father. So uh, grace permeates this kingdom. And, you know, Luther is right in saying, uh, in echoing what Jesus says, Luther talks about how the, uh, the authentic real church exists within the church as an institution. The church uh, as an institution is an earthly thing, but the true church uh, is composed of those who uh, trust in Jesus Christ. And this is reflective of what Jesus says about uh, the wheat and the tares, the wheat and the weeds growing alongside. Jesus says he's going to leave them alone until the day when he will judge people, not on the basis of their deeds, but on the basis of their faith in Christ, and their repentant faith. Um, so the kingdom of God or the kingdom of the right is the kingdom of grace in which Christians voluntarily accede to civil authority for the benefit of their neighbor, for the benefit of the gospel, and um, uh, in which they operate under the reign of God for the sake of the neighbor, as, as well as out of gratitude to God. The other kingdom, the kingdom of the left, is the kingdom of civil authority that God has established. Uh, God understands human nature better than most human beings do. He knows that we are sinful by nature. As um, uh, Genesis puts it, that the inclination of the human heart is evil uh, altogether. And as a paraphrase, but you get it, it's in Genesis 6 and Genesis 8. And, you know, David says in Psalm 51, verse 5, uh, you know, I, 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 I was, uh, I've been a sinner from the womb. I was conceived in sin. sin. And uh, so he, God understands human nature. This is why God uh, came into the world in the person of Jesus Christ to save us from ourselves. But not all people trust in Christ. Not all people have undergone the regeneration that occurs in holy baptism. Not all are living in daily repentance and renewal. And so, um, in order to prevent humanity from utterly destroying itself, uh, unregenerated humanity from destroying itself and destroying others, destroying believers, God establishes civil government. Now, Paul believed this, even though I'm sure he had problems with the Roman regime. He was, of course, as you know, a Roman citizen. But, uh, you know, Paul still, as was the Jewish tradition, when you look at the Old Testament, at figures like Joseph and Daniel, he was nonetheless complicit, not complicit, obedient, to the governing authorities, and he saw that as beneficial for the common good, right? So uh, that's why many Lutheran theologians believe that it's possible that this res this uh, power, this uh, individual, or this uh, uh, system, or this uh, 
entity that is restraining the lawlessness, lawless one uh, until the time before the day of the Lord. I uh, believe it could be civil government. I hope that makes sense. Now, we do not know that. And it's okay for us to say we do not know that. But I think it's informed speculation. Nonetheless, something is restraining uh, the man of lawlessness until the right time. Uh, it says in verse 6, so that he may be revealed in his time. There will be a time for this man of lawlessness, this human agent of Satan, who is a liar like Satan, to work in the world. And as we saw uh, last week, this agent of lawlessness, this agent of Satan, will imbu be imbued with certain spiritual powers that will cause those who are not relying on Jesus Christ alone to be shaken, either shaken in their faith or shaken in uh, their allegiance to truth or both, and to chase after this person of lawlessness. Um, to believe that they are a powerful person. Uh, now we've see, seen these kinds of people arise throughout human history. We've seen them arise in our own day. Hitler bedazzled a lot of people in Germany, including many in the church. And there were many churches, most churches in Germany were acquiescent to Hitler's authority and his um, uh, infringement on the purview of the church, uh, the order of, uh, you know, the swastika being displayed on uh, church pyramids and so forth, um, various um, experiments in tinkering with the confessions in order that the church would be an agent of the Nazi state. We see this kind of thing happening all the time. Um, in North Korea, the dear leader and his uh, father and grandfather had attributed to them uh, de uh, deity, in essence, um, and, and that kind of allegiance. So we see the spirit of the Antichrist, as Luther put it, uh, operating in history, but some restraining uh, uh, force established by God has thus far in the history of the world prevented the lawless one, um, the one who has no regard for the truth, the one who has no regard uh, for good or evil, um, who seemingly does amazing thing um, has thus far been restrained. Then he talks in verse 7 about the mystery of lawlessness and says it's already at work. So you can see where Luther gets the idea of the spirit of the Antichrist working in our fallen world. We are headed for a certain denouement in human history and in the history of the cosmos. Um, we are operating in a time in which the one described as the prince of this world is trying to drag as many people down into hell with him as possible. Our call as the church and as Christians is to be part of God's rescue mission. We are in this world, as Peter says, foreigners, sojourners, strangers, um, who are to be God's operatives in God's underground, um, uh, trying to proclaim the gospel so that, and to administer the sacraments 
so that people come to saving faith in Jesus Christ and they will be spared the awful consequences of walking away from God or being heedless of God. Yeah, and when he talks about the mystery of lawlessness, this is sort of the opposite of the mystery of the gospel, a phrase that, or the mysteries of Christ that Paul talks about in his writings. Uh, when Paul uses this term mystery, he's not referencing something that we don't know, right? We know that Christ has died. We know that Christ has risen. We know that those who come to believe in Jesus come to believe in Jesus because of the operation of the word in preaching, teaching, reading, and the sacraments. We know that that's how we come to faith in Christ, and we know how the story is going to end. There's no mystery about that. We know that Jesus has triumphed over sin and death, and while Satan will do his worst, in the time between now and whenever Christ returns, there is no question that in the end, Satan and, uh, and the fallen angels and those who spurn Christ will be eternally condemned because that's the path that they have chosen. And that those who trust in Christ will be given a welcome into the perfected whole kingdom of God, W-H-O-L-E. That's, that's not the mystery of it. The mystery of it is, how is it that God, why is it that God goes to so much trouble for us? How is it that God is able to reach the minds, wills, and hearts of sinful human beings and to save them by faith and not by anything they do. That's the mystery. Well, the mystery of lawlessness will be how is it that, that, that people who have heard the gospel might turn away from Christ? Uh, that something so evil could actually entice human beings. Part of it is that evil tries very hard not to look evil, uh, but to convince us that it's of God and it's a good thing. Um, I read about a woman the other day who had uh, lost a child to, uh, she had a, what are they, an ectotopic uh, pregnancy and the baby died and a member of her, well, it was her mother-in-law, ex-mother-in-law, told her that this would not have happened to her had she been a believer in Jesus. She must be a very wicked, evil person. That mother-in-law was not speaking anything that is of God. Uh, Jesus says, you know, that horrors happen to those who believe. Horrors happen to Jesus Christ. Jesus says in John 15, in this world you will have trouble. Well, there's no question of that. The apostles almost all of them suffered and or died for their faith in Jesus Christ. So what would make us think that we are exempt from uh, the fallen nature of this world? People say things like that because it makes them feel superior. They have self-righteousness, but not the righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ. Um, but as a consequence, from what I can tell, this woman was totally turned off to Christian faith because of this false witness 
These are the kinds of people of whom Jesus warns us. And I'm convinced that one of the jobs of Christians today is to speak a clear, true word about the God we know in Jesus Christ, not soft peddling the law, which condemns the sin of all of us, but also proclaiming the grace of God given in Jesus Christ and the promise of Jesus Christ to be with us in all circumstances and the warning of Jesus that we would go through difficult, painful and uh, things in this world. But Jesus says those, this is Matthew 24, 13, those who endure the, until the end shall be saved. So, um, now into verse 8. I told you there's a lot to unpack in this chapter, and I hope I'm not just boring you silly. But I think this is really important stuff. Verse 8. And then the lawlessness, lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. This is really important. There will come a point in which the lawless one will be revealed. And people will understand it. And this presumably will be on the day of the Lord. Now notice what happens. The Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth. Well, you know, this is very evocative language. In, uh, in the book of Genesis, of course, God's spirit, breath, wind, moves over the water and brings created, ordered life into being. And then later on in Genesis 3, we're told that God blows his breath, wind, spirit, into dust scooped up from the ground and the first man is made. In John's Gospel, Jesus appears to the apostles in the locked room or the disciples in the locked room and he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Here we have the Spirit of God used to smite uh, or kill off the chaos and sin of the lawless one. In a, in a real sense, this uh, has more to do with Genesis 1 than it does with Genesis 3. Right? The gift of the Holy Spirit has more to, to do with Genesis 3, where God breathed and uh, human life came into being. Here, uh, what happens is that Jesus is going to destroy the chaos and the sin of the lawless one. Have you ever noticed that there are people who love chaos and uh, disruption and they're liars and they're disturbers and... Uh, just sinful, horrible, self-seeking people. There are such people. Well, Genesis 1, it describes that God's Spirit moved over chaos. That is, this is unformed, and I would say unrighteous something. Huh? Uh, someday God will explain it to us. Uh, it talks about the deep. When um, that term is translated into the Septuagint, the term is bathos. Now we get a very benign word, bath, from that. But bathos has the, this dark, deep, chaotic, killing something. Uh, 
I think of a black hole or, you know, the ancient Jews and, and the people of Jesus' time thought of the raging sea. That's why they were so terrified of, of the sea in Jewish culture. So the idea is that what, what Jesus is going to do is he's going to kill the one who's created all of this chaos, this darkness, this separation from God. Uh, the one who uh, claims to be of God or even God himself, remember, sets himself on the throne in the temple of God. And Jesus is just going to kill him with the, with the uh, chaos-destroying uh, breath of his mouth. And he will bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. In other words, the mere appearance of Jesus will bring all this evil to nothing. You know, we have a term, uh, and, you know, it's based on an old uh, philosophy of nihilism, uh, coming from the Latin term for nothing. Um, there are some people who are reflective of the satanic identity of destroyer. Uh, they are the spirit of the Antichrist. And what Jesus is going to do is finally, definitively, fully destroy the destroyer. Remember we have uh, God's word in Second Peter saying that the, the reason that Jesus has not yet returned is not because he's slow, but because He's giving us time to repent. There will come a point at which there will be no more opportunity for repentance. The jig will be up. Jesus will return. He will destroy the destroyer. And the, the lawless man who is of the destroyer. And he will usher in fully and definitively the kingdom of God for all of those who have trusted in Christ. Verse 9, the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. What was the truth they refused to believe? The gospel. Jesus says, John 14, 6, I am the way and the truth, and the life. So, first of all, the lawless one, as we've said already, comes uh, by the activity of Satan. First, Satan had to work on that lawless one. And, uh, um, you know, Satan doesn't care if people believe in him. In fact, it suits his purposes very well if people don't believe he's there. Um, because who, who wants to believe in someone who is all about self and destruction and nihilism? So Satan cleverly disguises himself and uses people uh, who he lures to worship themselves. Because if people are worshiping themselves or the things of this world, other than God, Satan has them. Misery loves company. And Satan knows how painful it is to God to lose any human being, right? We're told in the Old Testament that God does not want the condemnation of anyone. And that's why Christ went to the cross and bore uh, death, but also bore our sins on his shoulders, though he was sinless. Because uh, God hates the thought of losing anyone. This is part of why Jesus wept at Bethany after Lazarus died. It wasn't just because Lazarus died. It was because Lazarus's friends and family were weeping to use, uh, or mourning to use, uh, in Paul's phrase, as those without hope. 
they didn't understand that there is hope in Christ, which Jesus later uh, reiterated and underscored with Martha in John 11, verses 25 and 26, where he says, I am the way and uh, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, those who believe in me will never die and those who die will, you know, etc., live with God for all eternity. That's the idea. So first, the lawless one was worked on and turned away from God and from hearing God's word by the machinations, the activity of Satan. And then that, uh, that person's street cred, if you will, was underscored by the power and false signs and wonders and wicked deception that Satan is able to work. Remember what Jesus says of Satan in John 8, that Satan is the father of lies, who was a murderer from the beginning. And by that he means uh, he, in essence, murdered Adam and Eve by luring them into sin. And so uh, what we see here is that uh, uh, the, the lawless one comes to power by the devil, and the devil actually is able to do some signs that fetch people's attention. And I think I mentioned earlier, maybe last week, um, the situation of the magicians of Pharaoh in Genesis who were able to do a number of uh, almost miraculous signs. They were able to match some of the things that uh, God was doing through Moses and Aaron and thereby caused a hardening of heart in the Pharaoh and in other of the Egyptians. Okay, I've been going on some time here. Let me see if I'm, I've got any questions or thoughts. Okay, I didn't want to ignore people here. Um, I'll go on for a few more minutes here, and then uh, we'll pick up uh, tomorrow night. Verse 11. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion, so that they may believe what is false. In Once again, I, I turn to uh, the story of the Pharaoh and Moses in Genesis. It says, verse 11, therefore God sends them a strong delusion. Remember, initially the Pharaoh had a hardened heart. But then what happened was God said, okay, I'm going to let him stew in his juices and I'm going to harden his heart so he is the word of God cannot get through to him because that's the way in which I'm going to work out my salvation purposes for my people. So what we see here is that, yeah, God uh, wants to preach and teach his word to all people so that they will come to believe in Jesus Christ, who has already done everything necessary for us to be saved from sin and death. But if people are intransigent, and repeatedly and brazenly and in a very blasphemous way reject the word of God and uphold the lawless one, um, God is going to say, all right, that's it. He, so he says, he sends them a strong delusion. So they believe falsehoods. They believe lies. Um, there are some people in this world, how can I put this? They are so deluded, they think they're smart, but they're really stupid because they don't pay heed to the facts 
of God, God and what the life that God calls us to, the life not of arrogance in our righteousness, huh? but humility in the fact that God gives his righteousness to us and that God saves us not because of how wonderful we are, but in spite of the fact that we're not wonderful, right? Christ, the righteous one, died once and for all for the unrighteous. So it is in owning our unrighteousness and receiving the gracious gift of Christ's righteousness that we are saved. But when you believe in your own righteousness, you have a shell of cynicism around you and you prefer the truths that appeal to human ego to the lies that um, uh, that that tell us we're wonderful. So uh, we need to hear the truth of the gospel in order to be set free from our sin. But finally, what happens is God says, okay, I'm going to let you keep that shell of cynicism, of nihilism, of hatred. And you're going to have to live with that eternally because you believe, you want to believe what is false. Remember, you've heard me say this before, in Isaiah, the, uh, the, the prophet was told, and this is the old King James Version, speak of us, speak to us of smooth things. Don't, don't give us these, these prophecies that you've gotten from God that tell us that we're sinners in need of repentance and that God loves us, but he wants us to turn to him and turn away from our evil and our idolatry. Don't tell us that. That's not what we want to hear. Uh, and so <laughs> here is this, uh, what God is going to do after the lawless one has, has gathered this following He's going to let them live in their delusion because they didn't believe the truth but took pleasure in their unrighteousness which they thought was their righteousness because they thought they were wonderful people. Like that woman who told her daughter-in-law that her miscarriage was because she was wicked. That's what supposedly religious people who are confident of their own righteousness and how lucky God is to have them on his, their, not on his side. Uh, that's how they behave. And Paul is warning us against falling into that kind of behavior. So that's why when we come back tomorrow, he's going to talk about the importance to stand strong in our faith in Christ and not in ourselves. Let's pray. Father, we lift up to you the church. We pray that you would send the church into the world to share your word, the law that condemns our sin and the gospel that sets us free as we trust in Christ. Grant that your word will incite us daily to follow Jesus and to lift him up before a needy world. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for joining me tonight. I plan on seeing you tomorrow night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, I have a feeling we've got two more sessions here, and I'll talk more about future plans uh, either tomorrow or next Tuesday. God bless all of you. Bye now.